The observer pattern is a widely used design pattern popularized by the Gang of Four Design Patterns book, typically used to model event-driven applications where events can be intermittent in nature. In our previous discussion, we did asynchronous programming using callbacks, but callbacks have several limitations. Callbacks only execute once, so they are singular in nature. If you want to have the a callback execute multiple times, then we have to do some type of recursion or a loop. Most callback APIs also require a callback. When we're using a callback, we cannot leave it out. As an example, we have fs.write file, and the syntax for fs.write file are that the first argument is the file name that we want to write to, or the path. The second argument is the data that we actually want to write. And the third argument is the callback to execute once the file is finished. But in this example, we just only we only specified the path and the data. Okay, there's no callback. And this is pretty common as well. If we have any type of caching mechanism, sometimes we'll just want to split our code in half. So we'll say something like write this file asynchronously and while I do something else. But this syntax is actually not correct. If I, if I run this, it will not work. OK, so I'll get an error that it's expected a, a callback over here as the third argument. And inside of JavaScript, if you do not specify an argument, it will take on the value undefined. So what I really did was I specified this. Okay, and because I specified undefined and it was expecting a function or a callback, then we get this invalid um, function. So at least in JavaScript, um, callbacks are, you can't leave them out, even if you don't want to do anything. So how do I sort of fix this? In this scenario, you would just create a callback that does nothing. Okay, so over here we have an arrow function and the body of that arrow function is, is nothing. And now that's the only change that we made and now it, it'll work fine. Okay, so now we have this file file.txt. And the third issue is that callbacks always need to be at the end. So before we talk about the observer pattern, let's move into a bit of motivation. So this API over here is completely fictitious. It doesn't exist. We can't actually run this code. But consider a fictitious callback-based API, get data. And what get data does is it accepts user input from the console. So when I call this function, it's going to prompt the user for some input. And then after it receives that input, it's going to execute a callback. In this case, we'll call it after user input is our callback. And this function has in its parameters an error parameter and a data parameter, which represents the data that it's capturing. Okay. And what we want to do is we want to continuously accept user inputs. Okay, and this is something that is intermittent. We don't know when the user is going to type in something new. They might type in something new a few seconds later, or it might be several hours, and then they'll come back, sit down, and type some more. It's not something that we can hold up the system to wait for, so we need to do it asynchronously. Inside of our callback, once we receive the data, we do some processing on that data. Okay, and this process is synchronous and it's slow. And then afterwards, we call get data some more. So this will begin the process of capturing data again. Now the issue that we have is that if it's stuck in this process for a long time, during this time, if the user's typing in any input, it's not being captured because the data capturing process only begins once we call get data. But if we're stuck inside of here, we, we are not capturing data at that point. So we can see that this is one of the drawbacks that when we call, when we have callbacks, they're always executed at the end. Okay, so what we actually want is to build the ability to continuously queue up callbacks, even if the, the stack is temporarily blocked by 
a slow process. So this is where observers and subjects come into play. The observer pattern defines a one-to-many dependency between observables, also known as subjects, and observers. An instance of a subject can emit a signal to all observers when specified conditions apply. So we'll look at some built-in examples that use the observer pattern. Typically in these examples, we only need to write the code for the observer. Our first example has us looking at the read line. Readline is a Node.js package that provides support for console.io. Readline's interface class is an example of a built-in emitter that applications can register listeners to. We can create an instance of this with the create interface function, where we provide data stream for inputs and optionally outputs. For simplicity, we will only use the inputs in this example. Although output, you can guess, would be just output process.std out. So you can add output as well. So inside the observer pattern, one of the key methods is the on method, which is also referred to as a event listener. When we call rl.online, we are specifying that on each line event, this callback will execute. If we look at the API for the read line interface, it has specific events that it understands, the most common of which is the line event. The line event occurs when the terminal receives as its input a new line character. And so our callback will execute and print the input that it received. When we create a new observer, we are instantiating a new thread that will monitor a resource. For the rest of these demos, we'll be working with a terminal because we're going to be moving the cursor around, which is difficult to do inside of the debug console. So let me type in hello world, and it will print it back out. OK. So each time I print, I type in a new line, new line. Then it will capture that new line and print out everything else that I printed as well. OK. So over here, the difference is that we only set this up once, and it can fire multiple times. Okay. Um, so in this example of the read line, there are specific events that read line understands. Okay, and you can look in the documentation to find those six events. Um, in the read line example, the only real important one is going to be the line event. In the next example. We show that we can attach multiple observers to a single subject. In this case, we've simplified a bit of the code. Um, so our print function is now a inline function. Okay, so it takes an input and it just prints out the same output. It's just a little bit cleaner to write it like this. And the sort of meat of the code is on line seven and eight, where we are doing the same thing as before. We are attaching a event listener to the line events, which will print, but we're doing it again. Okay, so we can, we can have multiple event listeners, sometimes for the same events, sometimes for different events, attached to a particular resource. So in this case, the console has a, um, a listener for the line events, and it has another listener for the line events. So when a new line event happens, both of these functions fire. The order of which they fire are the order that they were declared in. So this one um, was declared first, so it fires, and then this one, although the, the, um, the output in this case is the same, so we won't even notice. Okay. Okay, so on each input that I type in, when I hit the new line, it'll print back out twice. 
Finally, let's look at the third example. Okay, so the third example goes over a common mistake um, that people make when they're first learning of the observer pattern. And that's just because they're, they, they're coming from a background of doing callbacks where you do things recursively. And even I fall into this trap every now and then. So over here, we have a read line interface that we create. Um, again, we're looking at just the inputs. Uh, we can ignore this for now. I'll come back to this on line five. Um, line seven, we have our print function. Okay. And so we'll come back to this as well after we set up the event listener. Okay, so we set a event listener on read line that checks for the line event and it'll call the function print. And print in this case, it does the following. It takes the uh, capture the user input and it prints it out. And then it does read line dot online. Okay, now what this does, what this did previously was it set up an event listener to look for a line event. Okay, so over here we're setting up a new event, a new event listener. So we'll have two event listeners when this calls after we push enter. Now where it gets weird is that now if we receive another event, this one is going to fire. Okay, so the event listener for this one, and then the event listener for this one is going to fire as well. So that both of those are going to execute. And what do each of these print functions do? It sets up another event listener. So we'll have four event listeners after that. So we go from one event listener to two event listeners to four event listeners to eight event listeners. It has this doubling factor. So be very careful. Typically, you don't want to put your um, you don't want to put your event listeners, your observers. You don't want to put them inside of a callback. Okay, you don't want to call it recursively like this because you're going to blow your stack. And so inside of uh, Node.js, they only allow you to have a maximum listeners of 10 by default. But that doesn't really sort of show this that well. So I'm going to set it up to 32. And then we'll see we'll run out of our um, available um, listeners really fast. OK, so let's run this. So one, two, notice it prints out twice. Three prints out four times. Four will print out eight times. Five will print out 16 times. And then over here, we blow our stack. OK, so we, we exceed um, the number of listeners that they allow us to have. OK. So again, just be very careful. Typically, you don't want to put, um, you typically don't want to put your observers inside of a recursive call. So there is a way to sort of write code like this. You can use the, the once function instead. OK, so if you want to, if we use the once function like this instead, this is fine. Although you lose a lot of the benefits of having a, a listener. If you, if you do this, you might as well just write callbacks. In this next example, we're going to be looking at our first instance of a observable or a subject class. In our previous example, we used the readline interface, uh, which we called RL. Uh, we used the onLine event to execute a callback each time a new line is encountered. The line event is emitted by Node.js's API when the user enters a new line. But it's possible to listen to much more than built-in events. We can write our own events by extending the Node.js event emitter class. So this day emitter class simulates a calendar by emitting a new day event every 240 milliseconds, although that can be controlled by changing the update time. 
inside of the Node.js API, the subject and the observer are both inside of the same class called the event emitter. And anything that extends the event emitter is going to have two methods. The method on, which accepts an event and is used to set up an observer. And we have the method emit. which signals to all observers. On line 14, we're using the emit method. Okay, so let's go through this code line by line. In order to, in order to access the event emitter class, we need to, we need to include the events module. Our day emitter class will extend the event emitter. Okay, and what this gives us access to is two methods, on and emit. And this gives us access to the on method and the emit method. When we construct a new day emitter instance, the constructor will be called, which um, by default, sets the takes in a parameter update time, and if we do not specify it, it sets to be 240 milliseconds in this case. Super is a built-in function that um, calls the constructor for the parent, in this case, the event emitter class, and that will give us access to the on and emit functions. We then create a new date um, using the date constructor. This date object will be stored in this.day. And um, we also store the update time. Next, we have a method start. What this is going to do is it's going to simulate a new day. So we're going to set the date using the date objects um, set date function to be equal to the current date plus one. Okay, so it adds one to the date. Afterwards, we are going to take that day, get the month, and get month is a bit strange in that um, it's zero indexed, so January is zero. Um, but that's not very common, so we're going to add one to it to just shift it over. And then afterwards, we convert it to a string we pad a zero in front of it if necessary. And for the get date, this is a bit different because it is not zero indexed. So it's a bit weird that this get month is zero indexed, but the get date is not zero indexed. And so that will give us the two digit month and two digit day. And then what the emit function does over here, for every listener that's, that's listening to this, I'm going to signal to them that a new day event has occurred, as well as I'm going to send, give them this additional information. So not only will they be notified that a new day event has happened, they'll get the month day information. Okay. And then afterwards we call a sleep function. Okay. And the sleep function in this case will set a timeout. So it's going to sort of run a function after a specific time interval, in this case, the update time. Okay, so after 240 milliseconds, it's gonna run a function. What does this function do? Well, it's a function that calls start. So it starts again. So essentially it's going to jump back and forth between these two functions, start and sleep, um, each time increasing the date and signaling that there's a, a new date has occurred. Okay, but notice that inside this code, we don't have any. We don't have any observers. We only have an emit function. So this is acting as a subject. Okay. So we're going to next look at the observer inside of our index file. So inside index.js we have our observer. Over here we require our data emitter class. We instantiate an instance of it. And then over here we use the data emitters on method. Okay, so this is setting up an event listener. The event that we're listening for is the new new day event. Okay, which is emitted 
on line 14 over here. Okay, so when this, each time this happens, this entire block of code executes, which in this case moves the cursor to 0, 0 of our terminal, clears the line, okay, it writes the received information, okay. Um, this syntax over here is a destructuring statement, so it takes the object that we received, the object in this case is this object over here, and it breaks it up into the component variables. In this case, it's just month, month, day, day. And this is just to generalize it um, in case I want to add additional components inside of here later on, that this would always be fine as long as it's named the exact same variables. When you use the structuring, uh, when you use the, the structuring assignments, the property names are important, so they must match. Okay, so once I've extracted out the month, month, day, day, I can write that value, and then I'm going to move the cursor to the next line. Okay, and every 240 milliseconds, this is going to occur. Okay, so it's going to constantly write the new date on the, the top of the page, erase the line, and then repeat that process. So if I run this, okay, starting from the current date, it's going to increase by one every 240 milliseconds. And we can adjust this by changing, by adding a time frame. So if I want it to be much slower, I can say something like a thousand here. So now it'll be every 1000 milliseconds. Okay, so it's much slower now. And if I made it a smaller number, it would be much faster in contrast. The day emitter acts as a observable or a subject and our index.js file over here, this specific block, acts as an observer. The syntax for the on method is that it accepts a event name, which must be a string, followed by a listener, which is a callback function. And so it registers a listener for event name. Once registered, each time an event is emitted, to the listener is added to the event queue. This process is typically referred to as adding or attaching an event listener. And the emit function, okay, so the emit method takes in a event name, which is also a string, and a the any argument afterwards is sent over as data, okay? But typically I, ref I prefer to send over a single object compared to having a big comma separated lists. So in my demos, at least, I'll be s the second parameter represents the data. Although you could have, you can put more data afterwards. You can put other data over here if you wanted to. Okay, and that would be attached like this, if you did. In the second example, we had this set timeout function, and it used an arrow function over here. In previous examples, I mentioned that arrow functions behave similar to function expressions and declarative functions. There are some key differences, however, in that arrow functions do not have a this binded to itself. So because it does not have this binded to the function itself, it's going to use the this variable of its lexical scope. In this case, it's going to refer to the day emitter. If I were to use a standard function instead, this would bind to the function itself, which does have a this instance. And so we get problems in this case. Um, in this case, it's going to print out a timeout object if I use the standard function over here. Whereas if I'm using an arrow function, because the arrow function does not have a this binding, 
it's going to bind to the parent class, which is this example in this case, which is what we actually do want. So if I run this, okay. So the first one that prints out is this timeout object. Okay, and this is because it's binding to the set timeouts function, which when we look in the internals, it creates a this timeout object. And then the second example, it binds to the this example, which is what we actually wanted. So just be a bit careful. Typically, when you're working with event emitters, you want to use the arrow functions for these types of scenarios because you want the lexical scope. It's very rare that you actually want the, the timeout object in this case. In this next example, we're going to be building on top of the day emitter class that we looked at previously. So all this code is the same. Uh, we're going to be writing a new class called birthday emitter. And birthday emitter does not actually extend day emitter the way that um, day emitter extends event emitter. Rather, the birthday emitter builds on top of day emitter using a technique called composition. And composition is when you take in a instance of a uh, smaller class, in this case day emitter, as one of your parameters, and you use it in part. So over here inside our constructor, we are using this day emitter as one of the parameters and we're listening to it. We're attaching a, a listener to the new day event. So when we're creating a birthday emitter, it takes in two parameters. The first one is birthdays and this is what birthdays looks like. It's just a JSON file of a bunch of birthdays. Okay, so it's got a name property. So it's an array of name, month, and days. So it takes in this entire array of data, and it also takes in a day emitter, which we have to instantiate beforehand. So if we look at this index file, okay? So the first line over here on line six, we instantiate a new day emitter instance. In fact, we can just use the default value of 240 milliseconds initially, and we'll adjust it as we need. And Taking this day emitter that we've just instantiated, we feed it into the, the birthday emitter. Okay, so we take this day emitter and we plug it into uh, the birthday emitter as one of its parameters. So the two parameters are birthday and day emitters. And so we uh, plug them in inside of here to create the, to make sure that the constructor is executing correctly. So this function super, we, we've used it previously as well. Uh, it just, uh, it's required if we're going to be, if we're going to need the on or the emit method, we have to call the super method. So because we use uh, down here, we use this.emit, okay? Because we use this emit function, we need to have it available beforehand. So, uh, so that's going to, we're going to access that we're going to get access to that by extending the event emitter class, which supplies that for us. OK, so this is where the, the meat of the code is. Um, so we're going to take that day emitter object that was passed in into the constructor, and we're going to set a new listener for a new day event. So this, this, uh, this day emitter emits a new day event every 240 milliseconds. OK, and this birthday emitter class it's going to listen for those. Um, it's going to listen for to those emits every 240 milliseconds, and when it gets one, it's also supplied a month, month, day, day object, which it's going to parse into the month and day. So this represents the the current month and day, and it will update every 240 milliseconds with the the new month and day. And what we're going to do over here next is we're going to look through the all the birthdays. So again, we're going to sort of loop through all these birthdays. And we're going to filter out any birthdays where the the birthday month doesn't match the current month and the birthday day doesn't match the current day in this case. So we we're only we only want to keep the the matching ones, the birthdays that match the current day. Okay? So anything that doesn't match will get filtered out. 
And then from those filtered results, we are going to loop through them, okay? And for each birthday that's left, we're going to emit a birthday event. Okay, so essentially what this does is that because it has this day emitter that's emitting um, a new a new event every 240 milliseconds, it's going to catch that event. It's going to check to see if there were any birthdays effectively. And as soon as it finds the birthday, it's going to emit a birthday signal. But we need we need an app our application. Our application has to listen for this birthday signal. Okay. Okay, so this is probably more what you guys have. Um, so over here, we have our birthday emitter, which we instantiate with our birthdays and our day emitter. And we attach a listener using the on method for the birthday events. So when a birthday event gets emitted from the birthday emitter, the index, the code in the index file will catch that event and we supply it when it uh, when it emits. It also includes the birthday object, which is okay. so it would be the name, the month, and the day of the uh, the person whose birthday it was. Okay, so with that birthday object, we can print out we can print out the specific data. So the the name of the person, the month, and the day. So over here on when that event fires, we move the cursor to the current line. OK, move it to um, current line, which is set to be 1. We increase that by 1. OK, after, um, in fact, this should probably be underneath here. It's, it doesn't make a difference. It's just a little bit more clearer to read. Um, so we move the cursor to the current line, which starts at 1. We print it out, and then we increase the current line so that next time it comes around, it will uh, print to the next line. OK, so let's run this. OK, so there may be slight delays, because that would just signal that there's a long time period with no birthdays. And in fact, I didn't save this file. So in fact, it's using a much larger. So let me save this and run it one more time. So it's actually using the 240 milliseconds difference. This should be much faster. OK, um, just because I didn't save when I changed it from one second to 240 milliseconds. OK, so it's starting from today's date, which is uh, October 10th. And um, it's going to sort of every 240 milliseconds, a new day is going to pass. And if the day matches, it'll print out the birthday object. OK, but this is kind of hard to see because we, we don't have the we don't know which day it currently is until it sort of flashes by over here when someone's birthday happens. So I'm going to uncomment this piece of code. And this code should look familiar because it's the exact same code that we used um, two demos previously inside the 02 demo. Um, and that's sort of why we started current line at 1 instead of 0, because we reserve line 0 to print out the current date. OK. And so notice that this one is not listening for a birthday event. This one's listening for a new day event. OK, so it's listening to the day emitter. And so when the day emitter emits a new day event, we can sort of hook onto that as well. So now we sort of, in our application, we're listening for birthday events, and we're listening for um, new day events directly. And so we can have multiple of these types of listeners over here. So in fact, let's, let's run this. OK, so over here, we can see that the day is changing. And then as soon as a new birthday shows up, uh, sometime in November, then the birthday sort of prints out over here. And um, if we have a scenario where the, a particular uh, day has two birthdays, OK, then both of them will print out. OK, so over here, uh, January 21st, we have two birthdays that sort of instantly printed together. Because that's 
and that's because there was two birthday ev events emitted. Okay, so if we actually check the code over here inside of the birthday emitter. Okay, so if we actually look at the code inside the birthday emitter, then you can see that we filter out the non-matching ones, but there could be multiple results that are not filtered. And then for the ones that are not filtered, we emit a birthday event for each of them. Okay, so we will get multiple birthday emits from the um, the same from the the same search results. Okay, so from the same filtered results, we'll we'll get two events in this scenario. Okay, so. Essentially, what's happening over here is that our code instantiates a day emitter, which we sort of use as a clock. Um, if I change this value from 240 milliseconds to, let's say, 1,000, then the now every day is represented by one second. Okay, And because the birthday emitter, it doesn't really care what value you set, it only listens for new day events, then the birthday emitter will also be slowed down because I'm emitting new day events much slower. And the birthday emitter, OK, it only cares about the new day events. So if it's getting the new day events slower, then it will also slow down automatically. So you can see that there, it doesn't really, it can work independent of how I choose this day emitter to behave. They're not tightly coupled together. I don't need this. Okay, so this is a much slower version with the one second date, uh, one second per day. And you can see that you can see that the you can see that the birthday is still printing out um, in the correct date. So when this gets to uh, November twenty seventh, the the birthday will print out, but not until that happens. Um, so it, it doesn't. The, the birthday emitter is not sort of tied together to the specific time intervals that I set for the day emitter. OK, so I'll probably cut that down a bit just because it's a large gap. In this next demo, we're going to look at pausing. So the code for the day emitter has changed slightly. We've made some minor changes to the sleep method, as well as added a new method pause. So inside of the sleep method, we've created a new variable um, called this dot. We create, we've created a new timeout ID, which we've attached to the instance of the day emitter. And this takes on the value that set timeout returns. OK, so if you've never used set timeout before, the return value of set timeout is what we call a timeout ID. And that is just a unique number. I don't think it's anything complicated in the process of generating the unique ID. It, I think it just during execution, the first call to set timeout will return back one or two or, or some integer value. And then every time, every subsequent call just increases that, that integer value. So it's nothing complicated. But we typically don't care about the, the actual value. We just need to know that it's unique. And so this timeout ID is a way for us to cancel a timer. OK, so it's a way for us to cancel a timer if we wanted to. So we can feed in this, this timeout ID into a function called clear timeout. This is also a built-in function, like set timeouts. And when you feed it in, if the function has not yet executed yet, 
it will cancel it. So what we're doing over here is when we're when we're previously the the code did not have this set timeout. It looked more like this. Okay. And that just meant that we couldn't really sort of pause the behavior as it was running. Okay. But now now we can pause it by essentially the code jumps between start and sleep back and forth. And this is seeded with our index file when it when it first calls the the start process down here. Okay. Um, so it jumps between start and start call sleep. Sleep runs a set timeout function that calls start. So you can sort of see we're we're bouncing back and forth inside of here. So if at any point we want to pause that behavior, we can clear the timeout ID, which before we were just throwing out, and uh, that just means that we couldn't sort of pause it. But if we keep it this time, and instead we clear it when someone calls, this, calls the pause function, then we can sort of um, pr prevent this loop from occurring. Um, and even if it's already started, it'll, it will clear out the next instance. So this will sort of pause the loop. And then if we, call, if we want to start it again, we just call the start function again. And then that will sort of start the process again. OK. Um, so we also have birthday emitter over here. Um, but birthday emitter has no changes. So it's the same as the previous demo. OK. And this is going to be very important to us because I, I mentioned earlier that birthday emitter is sort of n is not coupled with day emitter. It doesn't care if you make changes to day emitter as long as it gets a new day event then it'll work. So we've, we've made changes. We've added this sleep and pause method, but it doesn't. we don't need to make any changes to this file. OK, so let's look at our index file. Um, most of it's the same. We've added a bit of extra so that we can pause. So again, we our code itself, um, first, it, uh, it creates the day emitter class and the, it imports the, the day emitter and the birthday emitter class. Um, it pulls out the birthdays.json file, which is just the same JSON files with the name, month, and uh, day. It instantiates an instance of day emitter. And then it instantiates a instance of birthday emitter by feeding in the day emitter and the birthdays. OK. And then afterwards, we're going to start printing birthdays um, when the birthday events are, are uh, every time I hear a birthday event, it's going to uh, print the, the birthday to the next line. OK. And again, we start from line one because we reserve line zero to print out the day. And the new piece of code that we have over here is that we are listening for key presses. And this is also done using event emitters. So this is a good sort of uh, example as well. Um, so we don't know when the person is going to be typing. They, they're, it's, it, it's very intermittent in, in nature. Uh, and in this case, we're listening for specific key presses. So if we're looking, if we're listening for specific key presses, we need to import the read line, okay? But we're going to be changing the process over here. It says um, read line that emit key press events. We need to sort of toggle this function on because by default it's it's not on, and um, both of these two lines are used to have it such that it's going to emit signals for every key press. And before it was only for for line events. OK, so once these two are enabled, we can start listening to key press events. And so over here, we're listening to one specific. Um, we're, li we're listening. We attach a event listener to process.stdn. So we're attaching a key press event. And the key press event, it, when it occurs, it's going to trigger this function. Okay. And it's going to give us back as it inputs the character and the key press uh, objects. 
the the character should be obvious it's what character was typed in but the key press object allows us to do meta programming about the keyboard so was the person holding shift were they holding control were they holding alt were they holding the uh the meta key the the windows or the apple key etc so if if someone wants to type in if you wanted to detect something like shift shift space or shift x shift z or something you can do that using this key press object okay so in this case um if the character that was typed in was the character p and the status is running so status over here is a variable that we declared down here which we initialized to running okay if the status was running then we're going to pause we're going to call dayemitter.pause and change our status to be paused. So this will the, this will break that loop which we saw earlier um, over here. This will break this chain of going from start to sleep because we call this pause function, which calls the clear timeout, and then that will cancel this uh, timeout. Okay, so we'll cancel this timeout, And then we'll set our status to pause. If we're already in pause and we hit the R key instead, we call day emitter dot start to restart the cycle. So if it was paused, we can start it again with, because calling the start function will call sleep and then sleep will eventually call start again. So this will start and stop the, the process. Finally, we have one uh, one more that we have to add. So if you ever switch your, your keyboard to raw mode, there's a drawback in that now you have to specifically, you have to explicitly sort of listen for, uh, you have to specifically listen for control, um, control C. If you wanted to sort of exit your program, normally this is given to you for free. Okay, if you're inside of uh, sort of non-raw mode, of just read line mode standard but when you switch to raw mode then this might be something that you want to detect you might want to detect when someone types control c and do something else instead of um, exiting the process okay so you've sort of taken control over that but that also means you have to clean up the pro you have to clean up after yourselves so in this case when the person types in uh, the c character and um, so this is another way to access the character. I could have used character is equal to C, uh, but you can also use key press that name. And you can just print out the entire key press object if you want to see all the um, specific properties. Just use a console.log key press to, to look at all the properties inside of it. Um, but this is the same as using character. So if key press that name is equal to C, so if it's the C character and key press that control is equal to true. So if the person types in control C, then I'm going to terminate the process. Okay, and again, this, you only need to do this if you're switching to, to raw mode um, to process character by characters. If, if you're using the standard read line, you, you, you don't have to listen for control C to, to close your program. Okay, so let's, let's run this. Okay, so this is going to print out the um, birthdays every and every day is going to cycle at 240 milliseconds. Okay, and it's going to continue to print and update the date until I press the P key. Okay, so I'll press the P key now. And so you can see that the date is now sort of frozen over here and no more birthdays are emitting. Okay, because there are no new day events. Okay, because I've stopped this cycle of of looping between these two, this function, this line on line 13, this line never executes, okay? And because this line never executes, inside of the birthday emitter, this piece of block never catches anything. Everything's still working, it's just that because that there are no new day events, there's gonna be no birthday events, okay? So because this is not receiving any new day events, it's not going to emit, and so, our index file, everything is still still working. Um, it's just that those events are no longer emitting. And that's one of the key sort of differences between callback-based mo models and event-driven models. Event-driven models are perfectly fine 
if you don't get any events, okay? All this code is still sort of valid. It's just that, well, I'm waiting events for an event that's never going to happen. Okay, so let's go back to the application. Okay, so this is still frozen, uh, and, but we have the release key. If I push R, which I'll do right now, then it will continue, it will start up that loop again, okay? And once it starts up again, the day emitter, okay, is going to continue to emit every 240 seconds, and then the birthday emitter will catch that and uh, update the correct values. Okay, so I can pause again. So that's what I mean by the birthday emitter not really caring about the the behavior of the day emitter. As long as it gets a, all it cares about is that I'm listening for a day emitter, a new day event from this object. And when I get that event, I'm going to execute this piece of code. Okay, so if there's something that prevents this from emitting a new day event, everything that's listening to those new day events will also sort of just pause their behavior. This next example is going to be slightly more complicated. We'll be looking at a stock simulation system. Okay, and the sort of base idea is just that we're going to have a bunch of stocks um, that we have inside of a JSON file. Okay, and each stock is going to be composed of a stock ticker, a stock name, a price. Uh, some stocks will have a volatility value. Um, if they don't have a volatility value, I believe the default is just um, 10 percent, okay? Um, and a sort of growth um, value. I think certain companies have, I think the default value for growth is 7 percent. right? So the default volatility is 10 percent and default growth is 7 percent. And this is just, you don't really need to know the details about this. All you have to know is that these values, when I use it inside this function tomorrow's price, it takes in the current price and it will do some math to just change that number around. Okay, it'll just do some a random walk to make the uh, price go up or down some random amount uh, each day. And so in order to sort of simulate the, the price changing every day, we're going to be using the new day event to um, showcase when a day changes. Okay, so the, the day emitter we're, we're reusing again. Okay, so essentially every 240 milliseconds or whatever time frame that I choose, the, it's going to emit a new day and every stock is going to listen for a new day event. And then when I receive a new day event, it's going to calculate the, the price. Okay, so the price is going to be called using a function tomorrow's price. So this is going to calculate the new price given the current price. And then it's going to emit a signal. Uh, over here, we also emit a new day signal. So the key difference is this is not going to be day emitter dot new day. This is going to be a stock dot new day. So if we look at our index file, we're listening for stock dot on new day events. Okay. And I, I purposely named it the same to show that the name of these events doesn't really matter. Okay. So again, what this is going to do is when I receive a new day event from the day emitter, it's going to calculate a new stock price using the previous price, the volatility index, and the, the growth. That's going to be the, no, the, the new daily price. So imagine that it was $100 yesterday. Maybe today it will be 95 or maybe it will be 110 or something. Okay. So we don't really know the exact price. It's, it's a random value. So over here, we use a math.random to, to generate a new random price. Um, but it, you should but you should know that it's it's based off of the, the current price, okay? Um, so we calculate new values. Um, so using this, we calculate a change value. We also, ha we also have the, the previous values, and then we emit a, a new signal. So we emit a stock uh, new day event. And so that's, that 
that signal is going to include the current day, which we just um, sort of borrow from the day emitter. It includes the stock ticker, the name, the price, the previous price, and the change, which we calculate over here. When the next new day emits again, then we receive another new day. And uh, we set the previous day's price to be the current price. Okay. And then we calculate again a new price. Uh, again, using our um, tomorrow's date, tomorrow's price function. Okay, and that's based off of, and that's based off of the. In fact, this should probably be previous to be a little bit more clear. Okay, um, but it, it's the same because we just assigned them to be the same over here. Okay, so the the price is going to be the previous day plus the volatility and the growth. That's going to be today's price. Okay. And so the, then we calculate a change, and then again, we emit a new signal. So essentially, every 240 milliseconds, this stock is going to have its price change a tiny bit. Okay, So the price might be $100 the first day, then the next day it might be 105 then 120 then maybe it's 110 and then 90 and then so it can go up and down uh, variably. Okay? Um, the rest of these are just static functions that help us do that calculation. They're, they're not important at all to us. Okay. Um, what is important is the index file. Okay. So inside of here, we instantiate, we pull in our, our stock class and our day emitter class. Um, we pull in our portfolio data, okay, which is just the, the stocks that we're going to simulate. So over here we have um, eight stocks. One, two, three, four, five. No, we have nine stocks. Okay, so we have nine stocks over here. Uh, and so that's going to be our portfolio. And then we're going to set a day emitter. We're going to create our day emitter. I set it to be a large number, um, 2.4 seconds per day, um, just because there's a lot of data to look at. And if you want to get a just a um, quick glance, if you leave it at 240 milliseconds, it's, it's way too short. It just flies by. Okay. Um, so we instantiate an instance of a, so it goes through our portfolio data. And then for each portfolio data, we're calling, so each portfolio uh, for each element inside this array, we're going to, we're going to have ticker name and price. And so we're going to call, we're going to take that data that we have to stock. So it's going to have at least ticker name, price, maybe all volatility and, and growth. We're going to take all that data. Okay, um, call it stock. And we're going to pass it into the new stock constructor. Okay, and so that is going to create a new stock using that data. So it's going to take ticker, name, price. So those three, it, it must have that's sort of the requirement. It has to have those three. And then the other two values, volatility and growth, if it doesn't have them, they'll use the default value of 0 0.1 and 0 0.7. Okay. And so essentially what this is shorthand for is um, what this does is it goes through the each stock instance. And it, this is called the spread operator. It just pulls out um, each instance, each property instance inside of here. So it'll pull out ticker, name, and price. So we can sort of shrink it down to ticker stock dot ticker stock dot name comma stock dot price um, but it also generalizes it for every instance so in this case it only has three properties but in this case it has five properties okay so it'll, it'll generalize it for every case Okay, which is really nice. And then the other parameter, which is the same as our birthday emitter, is we're feeding it in the, the day emitter, which is going to behave as our clock. So again, it's going to have this day emitter, and we're going to listen for a new day event. Okay, that's going to tell our stock that it has to start emitting new signals because a new day has happened. So I'm going to calculate the new stock price, and then I'm going to emit my own new day event, which my index file listens for. Okay, so we haven't listened... We haven't set that up yet. 
um, but we're going to do that over here. So we're going to set the current line equal to be the number of uh, the number of elements inside of the portfolio array plus one. Um, why do we set it to be that value? I think we only use that so that we move it to the end of the, uh, we move the cursor to the very, the very end of the list so that we don't have a blinking white box in the middle of our, in the middle of our code, but it's, it's probably not that big a deal. Okay. So we're going to take, so this portfolio over here, um, it's, it's got inside of it, um, in our case, it's going to have nine stocks. Okay. So we have, in essence, we have nine emitters inside of here, inside of this, um, inside of this portfolio array, and they all use the same day emitter. So they all use the same clock. So we have one instance of day emitter, and then because we have nine stocks, this loop, this map function, it runs nine times, and it creates nine stock objects. Okay, so we're going to loop through those nine stock objects. For each one, it's going to have a um, stock represents the uh, the stock object that we created, and index represents the uh, index from which it's inside of the portfolio um, array. And the reason why I keep this index over here is because it's it's similar to inside of our first assessment when you had to preserve the index. So. If I did not preserve the index, there's no guarantee that the order that um, these stocks sort of print out is guaranteed. And in fact, they might come out in different orders. Okay. Um, but if I preserve the index, even though they come out in different orders, I can have them print to specific locations. So how I do that is I use this function process that cursor to, to, to sort of reserve space. So I've reserved the, uh, let's say, index um, one for, let's say, the Google stock. And I've reserved um, index two for the Apple stock, OK? Um, so whatever is the first stock over here, I've reserved that slot for it. And whatever st slot is over here, I've reserved that slot for it. And so that's what the preserving this index value is. So even though it arrives late, I'm going to, when it does arrive, I'm going to move my cursor up to that, that line that I reserved for it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to clear whatever was in there previously. I'm going to print out the new information, the ticker, the name, the price, um, and the, the change. And then I'm going to uh, move my cursor back to um, the very bottom of the page, which is the current line. Okay, so it's going to move it to the very bottom. And then when another um, ticker signals, let's say that the um, Apple ticker printed out first, and then... Um, let's say the, the Netflix ticker then um, executes. Then I'm going to jump to, let's say, line five or so. Okay, I'm going to erase that line, whatever was there previously. And again, I'm going to print out that value, and I'm going to move it to the very end. So right, this current line is just sort of a bit of cleanup to move it to the very end so, that's, so that we don't have that sort of box floating um, in the middle. This next one, again, same as before, we reserve line zero so that we can see the day and time go by. And so let's run this. So each day is represented by 2.4 seconds. So as we can see that the each on each day, the stock price will go up or down um, some, some sort of random value. Um, and so what's happening is that this one single day emitter is being listened to by nine, nine instances of stock emitters, OK, one for each of these stocks over here. And so when it emits a new day event, all nine of them sort of catch it. And then they all execute their own code, okay, which calculates a new price for the stock. And then they emit their own new day event. Okay, so they emit their own new day event, which then gets listened to by this piece of code. So because inside of this piece of code, inside the index file, we are also setting up nine listeners. And every time we sort of get a new New Day event, we go to the index that we reserved for that particular stock, 
and we print out that information. We erase what we, was there previously, and we print out the new information. So we are also going to, so there was also one additional one. So you can see sort of some of these companies are going sort of bankrupt. Um, I wrote a slightly changed version. So the, the core code inside of here is the same for this, this pretty version. Um, but I added color, I added um, formatting for the numbers, but the, the core code is exactly the same. So you don't need to worry too much about it. But if you, if you do want to sort of dig into this, you can sort of see how to do formatting inside of, uh, inside of Node. So we do have a sort of cleaned up version. Okay. So again, this is the same, but it'll tell you that oh, this went down today, this went up today. We have the, the current price and the difference over here. Okay, so this is sort of a, a stock simulator example where when a new day event happens, um, our day emitter signals to the nine stock uh, emitters that a new day has happened, those nine stock emitters calculate a new price for each of their stocks, and then they emit their signals. Those signals get caught by the, um, well, let's go to this one. Those signals get caught by each of these listeners over here that we set up. So we set up a specific listener for each instance of the portfolio elements. So each portfolio elements, which we created over here, so this created nine different portfolio elements based off of the data inside of the stocks.json file. That data, um, that data we created uh, event listeners for that. And so when those events fire, when those new day events fire, we catch them over here and we sort of update that information. So one thing that we could do is we could sort of import the same code that we used previously when we were doing the sort of pause code and it should work, um, technically at least. So I'm going to copy this code that we had previously that listened for the key presses. And in fact, let's move it to the, the pretty version. Okay, so the stocks right now are moving up and down every 2.4 seconds. And if I hit P, that should pause the day emitter. Okay, so day emitter is paused. And because the stock emitter is listening for the day emitters events, and those are not happening, then all the stocks sort of freeze as well. And if I hit resume, then the stocks will continue to go on again. I guess I could sort of pause this behavior. Um, and because I'm pausing the, the day emitter, it pauses everything else, which is a nice trick. OK, so I can, again, pause this. And let's move on to the next example. This next example is going to be the publisher subscriber pattern, which is a variant of the observer pattern, where we have a third entity that facilitates the delivery of messages. This third entity can take on many forms. Um, for this example, it's going to be called a messaging server or a messaging queue. The third entity grants us a additional decoupling uh, from the publisher from its subscribers. The publisher, which is the observable or subject, does not need to know of the existence of the subscriber, uh, which is our observer. And the subscribers do not need to know the existence of publishers. Instead, subscribers will subscribe to specific messaging servers um, that will listen to a specific event. Okay, so that event typically can be something like um, publish. Let's double check over here. Uh, right, so the event is publish for the messaging server. 
So subscribers will subscribe to messaging servers. They'll say, I want to get all your messages um, that you've curated. And publishers will emit signals to messaging servers. Um, messaging servers will then catch those signals and forward them to all its subscribers. The nice benefit of this is that because we have sort of this two layer of decoupling, it allows for subscribers to exist without any publishers and vice versa, meaning that the publisher can start sending messages even if there are no subscribers. Okay, it's just that no subscriber will get those messages, but the program still sort of works fine. And the subscribers can still subscribe to something even if there are no publishers. Okay, this was slightly different than what we had before. As long as there's a messaging server, you don't need either publisher or subscriber. And the system still works. It behaves a bit differently because um, you're subscribing to a newsletter that, that doesn't have any publishers or you're um, publishing to a newsletter that doesn't have any subscribers, but it still, it still technically works. And it's important because you may start out with no subscribers and then you may, you may get them later on and the vice versa and vice versa as well. And that you, that you're initially subscribed to a newsletter that doesn't have any publishers and then new publishers register for it later on. Okay. So just a quick uh, diagram. So we'll have a messaging server and we may have zero or more subscribers. Okay, in fact, there may be multiple messaging servers. Okay, and so let's say that um, this subscriber subscribes to this messaging server, this one subscribes to this one, this one subscribes to this one, and in fact, let's say that this one decides to get, he wants both of the um, newsletters. And then we may have publishers over here Okay. And the publishers may send data to various messaging servers. Okay. So in this case, if let's say, in fact, let me give them numbers, P1, P2, S1, S2, S3. Okay. So publisher one sends a message out to messaging server one. Then messaging server one, so it emits a signal, publisher one emits a published signal to messaging server one. Messaging server one forwards that signal to all its subscribers. So subscriber one and subscriber two will get those signals and will also forward the data. If publisher two emits a signal to messaging server one and messaging server two, then um, subscriber one will get that message Subscriber two will get that message. Um, over here, we can see that subscriber two gets that message twice, in fact, which may be something that you might want to look into. But that's one of the sort of flaws with our choice of emitter pattern, that if these two messaging servers don't know each other, then they might sort of um, forward the message twice. Okay, And then subscriber three also gets that message because message, messaging server two forwarded it. So let's, that, that gives you the high level idea of what we're trying to build. Okay. So the first piece of code that we're going to be looking at is going to be the, we can start from the very end. We'll look at the publisher first, okay? Just for simplicity. And so the publisher is probably going to be the easiest of our, all our codes. Um, typically, the endpoints are, are not that complicated. It's the, the middle, uh, the, the messaging server, which is the bulk of it. So our, our publisher class, it extends event emitter. So that gives it the emit and the uh, on method. And then essentially, when the publisher, when they're ready to publish a, a uh, document okay, or some data, so they're going to publish and then uh, publish that data. And it's going to emit a signal, publish, to anyone who's listening, okay? And that data is going to be forwarded as well, okay? 
So one thing that's interesting is that the publisher does not have a constructor method. And I believe that if you don't have the constructor method, it creates one automatically that automatically calls these super events. So we get we still get the this done emits. So if we don't particularly care about um, this particular object having its own custom constructor, then we can sort of just leave it out. Let's look at the messaging server. Okay, so the messaging server, when we construct the messaging server, um, we can, so we can see that the messaging server extends the event emitter. Okay, so inside the messaging server, we have a register function. And what the register function does is it registers a new publisher. It accepts zero more publishers. And then for each publisher that it gets, for each publisher that it gets, it's going to loop through all the publishers and it's going to establish a listener for the on publish events. So it's going to listen to this messaging server. It's going to listen to um, the publishers publish events. And when it, when it, when a publish event occurs, it's going to call a forward function. Okay. So it's going to call this dot forward. So one thing that I didn't, so one thing that I skipped over was this function, this dot forward that bind this. And this is going to be required because if we don't have this um, binding where we um, specify what this represents. So I'm choosing the function. I'm specifying that when I say this dot forward, I'm referring to this function over here. And this is going to be required because publisher, um, publisher is an, an object. So when I call a on method on the publish events and I say something like this, then it's going to try to refer to the publishers this instance because this is an object itself. It's going to try to use uh, publishers. It's going to look inside of here for a forward function. It's not going to find it. And what I'm saying is when I specify this dot forward, I mean this instance of forward. I don't mean the publishers instance of forward. Okay, and the same thing goes over here. So over here, we have a deregister function. Um, and this uses the off function, which we haven't discussed. But it's if we have an existing um, listener, we can remove it by using the off function. And then finally, we have the subscribers. Okay, so subscribers are going to um, subscribe to messaging servers. They don't subscribe to publishers directly. And so they're going to use a function subscribe. Um, they're going to use a function subscribe that, again, takes a list of messaging servers. And then for each messaging server, it's going to for each messaging server, it's going to listen for a publish event. And then when it receives a publish event, it's going to, uh, again, call a function receive in this case. But again, we, we did this binding trick um, because, again, uh, messaging servers, they it's going to check the messaging server for the receive function otherwise. So we need to bind that receive. When I say this.receive, I'm referring to this function over here. So this.receive will call this function. And then over here, we have a call to this.onReceive. And that is specified by a callback. So when we create a subscriber, we're going to have a name as our first parameter. OK, so what do you want to call the subscriber? And the second parameter is a bit strange. The second parameter in this case is a function. OK? And it's going, it's, it, it's a callback function. It just basically says, what do you want me to do when I receive a new publish event? 
and the default, okay, so this over here is the default. The default is if I receive some data, I want to print it to the console. But we'll see later on that we're not going to use the default every time. Okay, so let's look at the index file, which is also very complicated. Okay, so over here we set up a messaging server, a publisher, and a subscriber. Okay, so we, we pull in those three classes, and then we are setting up um, three messaging servers. So in fact, let's break out our, our whiteboard. Okay, so the first thing that we're doing is we are creating three messaging servers. Uh, so it's going to be cat news, dog news, and animal news. Uh, cat news, dog news, and animal news. In fact, I'm going to move animal news in the middle just because I'm anticipating that the lines are going to be crossing. Okay, and then we're going to set up three publishers, Cat Facts, Cat Chronicles, and The Daily Dog. Cat Facts, Cat Chronicles, and The Daily Dog. And then we are setting up We are registering cat facts. So we're going to, for cat news is going to register. So cat news is our messaging server. Cat news is going to register the two publishers, cat facts and cat chronicles. Okay, so so let's look into this a bit more into details. So when we call the register function, so cat news dot register, that's going to be a messaging server. So cat news is a is a messaging server, okay. And we're going to call the register function, okay, which takes in a array. Um, uh, so this takes in a uh, a comma separated list of arguments. So in this cat face, two publishers, okay, and so. The publishers themselves are moved into this variable args. Args is just an array. Um, over here, if it's a nested array, we just get rid of the, the nesting. We'll call that publishers. So publishers is an array of, in this case, two um, publishers. And then for each publisher, we're going to set up a listener for the publish events. And when we receive a publish event, we're going to call the forward message to emit it um, to all people who are listening to this messaging server, which currently is none. Okay, so that also happens with dog news and animal news. Next, we set up three subscribers cat fan, dog fan, and animal fan. Okay, and these three subscribers, okay. Um, Their name is cat fan, dog fan, and animal fan, but their callback is not console.log, okay? Because we've the default will be console.log, but we're not using the defaults. In fact, we have our own print function, okay? So it's going to print to um, it's going to print to column one, print to column two, and print to column three. So we don't really know what that means yet. Let's jump to this print function which we have over here. So what this print does is it creates a three column, three column sort of layout inside of our terminal. Um, so the specifics we don't need to worry too much about, but basically every sort of 32 characters or so, it represents a new column. Okay. Um, and the details of this are sort of sort of abstracted away from us. So we don't need to worry too much about it, but it, it sets up three columns. So instead of calling 
a console log, we do print of column one of the data, print of column two the data, and print of column three of the data. And then finally, we have the, subs the, the subscribers. So these are the subscribers that we created. And then we subscribe. So CatFan is going to subscribe to Cat News. DogFan is going to subscribe to Dog News. And AnimalFan is going to subscribe to Animal News. So we have CatFan, DogFan, and animal fan and cat fan subscribes to uh cat news uh animal fan subscribes to animal news and dog fan subscribes to dog news in fact we are missing a couple okay so over here we registered cat facts and cat chronicles but we didn't do the other two so dog news subscribes to um, over here, and animal new animal fan subscribes to cat news and dog news. They don't subscribe to the cats. Uh, so animal news. Okay, so this one is a bit interesting. Animal news. Okay, when it registers, uh, so animal news should have on this a bit earlier. it's going to subscribe to dog news and cat news okay so this is where it gets slightly complex okay so there was there is no specific type requirement that a messaging server has to only subscribe to publishers so in this case, what Animal News can do is, if it wants everything from Cat News, um, then it can subscribe to Cat News. And that way, if a later on, if if a new publisher comes around, okay, let's say Publisher X, and they start sending messages to Cat News, then Animal News will get that new publisher as well. Whereas if they manually subscribe to Cat Chronicles and cat facts if a new publisher comes along it's not going to have that information so instead it's subscribing to the entire messaging server when this one emits a, a published signal then give me that information i'm going to forward it okay and, and again it does it for the dog news as well so if later on if a, a new dog publication comes in it'll get that that information as well okay so this one's a bit clever in that it's it's subscribing to other messaging servers to get all the information so animal news in fact, it will get all three publications in this case. Okay, so what's going to happen over here is we're next we're going to um, over here we pull out our data. So we have the news articles, which are just um, cat facts, dog facts. Um, this is not important. Okay, so it's just cat facts and dog facts. And what we do over here is we get back a random fact. We get back a random fact to act as our um, news article. Okay, and we set up keyboard events. Okay. So if I press the the one character, okay, if I hit, press the one character, then the Cat Chronicles, okay, the publisher Cat Chronicles, is going to publish a new Cat Facts. And this will just trim it down to just make sure it fits the width of my, my screen. If I print the, the two, if I press the two key, then Cat Facts, the second publisher, okay, in fact, I should have it over here. So if I press two, if I press one, Cat Chronicles sends a message out. If I press two, Cat Facts sends a messaging out. If I press three, uh, the Daily Dog publishes something. And then uh, what's going to happen is all those messages are going to filter out to the specific recipients. And then when each of those 
people get that event, they're going to call their own custom print function, and it's going to print to the specific column. Okay, And then I have the last one. If I press Control c it'll, it'll terminate the application. So this one's probably better to be seen than to be sort of explained. Okay, so these represent the sort of mailboxes of each of the individual fans. In fact, let's uh, expand this a little bit more. Okay, so if I push one, okay, that means that the Cat Chronicles is going to publish a news article. And because the cat fan and the animal fan are subscribed to that um, particular messaging server or servers that use them, then they will get those messages. Okay, so we know that cat fan, um, so if I push one, push one cat chronicles um, publishes. So this one over here, one second. So if I press one, this, um, pub <clears throat> if I push one, this publisher publishes. And so I just have to follow the diagrams in this case. So cat news is subscribed to cat chronicles and cat fan is subscribed to cat news. So cat fan will get it. And Animal News is subscribed to, to Cat News, so it will get this as well. Okay, so this will get it. And then because Animal Fan is subscribed to Animal News, Animal Fan will get that message, but Dog Fan will not get that message. Okay. Um, so similarly, if I push two, then this one will publish. And again, it will be the same two people who get it. Okay, so if I press three, that's the the dog newsletter, and so the uh, the dog fan and the animal fan will get the results. Okay, so I'm going to push three next, which will give a dog event. If I push three a couple more times, okay, it'll sort of get new dog facts. And if I then push one and two, okay, you can see that the cat chronicle and the cat facts are sending events out and that each of the facts are received by cat fan and animal fan only. So we can sort of see how we can sort of simulate this subscription service. And the very nice thing about this is again that we don't need to start off with any subscribers or any publishers. Um, as long as we have our messaging servers set up, then we can add publishers and subscribers later on. Okay, so we can add new publishers really easily. Okay, and um, existing sort of subscribers um, will get all the, the messages if they're subscribed to the correct um, either messaging server or publisher. And existing subscribers will get the, the new messages if they're subscribed to the right uh, messaging servers. So the last thing that is up for discussion is going to be the sort of um, some improvements. So there's this notion of push and pull. OK, so when using the observer pattern, you can choose how to structure your data flow. When using the observer pattern, you can choose to structure how your data flows. And there are two widely used models called um, push or pull. And the what we've been using up until now is the push model. Um, and in this case, the observer is sent to data. So all the data, every time that we send a e emit function, so if we look at the, the publisher, OK? Um, every time we set a emit function, we also include the data. Okay, and the same thing with um, the messaging server. Okay, when we uh, emit, we also include the data itself. And this works fine if the data is relatively small, if it's like a piece of text or something. But if it's really large, if it contains like images and stuff, you can see that this can um, be expensive, especially when um, on the 
on the receiver side, they do filtering. So they sort of receive this data. They might not even use it, okay? Um, right, so it, so it can create some efficiency problems if the um, observer does not need the data for every event. There's also a tight coupling with this model as the observable typically requires some knowledge of the observer. You're sending me a... Um, you're sending me data along with this event, and I need to know how to process this data. So we do have some form of coupling over here um, in that I need to know what this data represents beforehand. And the other model um, that you can use is the pull model in which the observer is still sent a signal. So this, this emit still, still signals, okay? So it looks more like this where a publish event is sent out, but if the person or the application actually wants that data, it has to make an explicit request for it. So if it wants this message back, when it gets that emit signal, it has to download the message or it has to get the message itself. And this keeps your, um, this keeps your API a lot more decoupled because it does not sort of need to know the structure of data beforehand. And it's also more efficient because if the, a lot of times the application might not actually need any data, it just needs to know that a specific event has occurred. And in those scenarios, if you sort of publish all this metadata inside of it, it can be wasteful. With that, we finished the observer pattern demos. So you, at this point, you should be able to start the assessment to see if you understand the topic.